All right, I'm going to be your MC today for Testimony Sunday. So I'll just start by saying anyone's welcome to come up. No testimony is too big or too small. Um, the point of testimonies is just to glorify God and to make much of Jesus. So I've, we've got a few people I know um, that have got something to share today, but I thought maybe I'll kick us off um, with a testimony that happened a few years ago, but is still something that I always come back to um, when I need a reminder that, you know, God is our great provider and nothing escapes his, his um, notice. Um, so this is <laughs> quite a few years ago when I was still living in Singapore. Um, I'm a preschool teacher by training and I was teaching um, in, a little, in a little preschool. And there had been a season where I wasn't coming to church and I wasn't really in community and I wasn't really in relationship with God. Um, but I had, praise God, a mother who prayed and prayed and prayed in her little closet for me. And um, God brought me back to himself. Um, and it was one of the best things that ever happened. Um, and what happened was when I had this personal revival and I came back to the Lord, the Lord challenged me to take a sabbatical from work um, and to go and attend um, a little, like a foundation course at a small Bible school in Singapore. So I said, all right, Lord, <laughs> here we go. So I signed up for this course and I, and I took a sabbatical from work and um, didn't have a lot of savings, but paid for the course started doing it and it was probably about in the second of three months the course was three months and then about the second month um I was really starting to run low on funds and I was like okay Lord you told me to you know stop working and to do this thing but I don't know how I'm going to keep going with this and um one day after our sort of first class in the morning one of the um ladies came to me she was a missionary from Nagaland and she gave me this little like a little verse card, and I think it's from Micah, it said, um, the silver is mine and the gold is mine. And I said, oh, that's interesting. Um, and I said, okay, Lord, if it's yours, then can you share some with me? Um, and, um, and I sort of put it in my pocket and I went away and didn't think too much more on it. It was still sort of on my mind, like, okay, I'm not sure how I'm going to get through to the end of the course till I go back to work at some stage. Um, but later that same week, my boss, my, my boss rang me up and she said, oh, hey, by the way, how are you doing? How's your course going? I said, no, it's, doing, it's going really well. I'm really enjoying it. Um, and she said, oh, can you, you know, can you spare some time this week? I just want to quickly meet up with you and give you something um, that I'd forgotten to do. And I said, oh, all right. So um, end of the week, on my way to class one morning, I, um, she lived quite close to me, so we caught up. Um, just at the bus stop where I was catching my bus to get to class and she handed me an envelope and she said oh when you uh, when you finished up at the end of last year um, the course started in January I you know I was handing out like little bonuses and I forgot to give you yours and so she handed me an envelope with a thousand dollars in it <laughs> and I just was like gobsmacked and it carried me through and you know it's still something that I, that I look back on um, and I tell myself when I'm feeling a little bit low that, you know, nothing escapes God's view. And if he's told you to do something, he'll provide for you. So she had no idea. She had absolutely no idea. But gosh, I just like had to hold my tears in until I got on the bus. Um, so yeah, to kick us off, God is good. God is really good. All right, now I'm going to invite a very happy chappy. Rocco, will you come and share with us? He's one of the most cheerful people I know, Rocco. Hello. He's always got a smile and always got a hug for you and always, always an encouraging word. Hello, everyone. Um, hello, church. Hello, family. Um, testimony? Yeah. Um, I was thinking about, there's a lot of testimonies, but I was thinking about a specific area on children because of the fact that... Um, the scripture that says you've got to be childlike to get into the kingdom. And that's always played on my mind ever since I've been saved. What is childlike? What is it? What, what does it present? How can I be childlike? And I 
thought about it and thought about it and thought about it and prayed and prayed. And, and a few incidences have happened to show me what he's talking about, his peace and his joy. His peace and joy, um, if you have that continuously, like he, he, he bequeathed his peace to us just before his death in John 14, 27. Um, peace I live with you, my peace I give to you. So that's his peace in us. So that becomes, so how does that reflect back to childlike? And I've got, um, there was, and I thought, for children have to be grow, have to be brought up in in a Christian family or some sort of spiritual enlightenment with the family, and this way they tend to have their um, experience with with Jesus. And um, then there was this this situation with um, little Charissa. Charissa, my daughter, she um, continually prayed with me, and any time she was injured or Something little happened. She said, Daddy, can you pray with me? So we prayed together. It was a constant thing. So in her, in her, um, in her spirit, it was always Jesus first. Amen. Go back to him. Whatever happened in her life, go back to Jesus. And we prayed. So we're in Bali and um, this is sort of a, 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 um, an indication of where her spirit lies immediately as a child. And um, my wife, we're in Bali and bathroom and kids were having a shower and there's water on the floor and Linda slips and hits her head without no bracing straight to the floor on this um, uh, tiled area. So Teresa opens the door of the shower, puts her hand on it, starts praying, declaring, she's fine, everything's fine, you're doing well, uh, Jesus, Jesus healed, Je declaring Jesus continuously over her. Linda was going in and out of consciousness and then she woke up and she was fine. It was only a slight bruise on her left, I think it was her left cheek. It was just because it's the way she hit. It was a slight bruise and no, no ramifications. No, yeah, so that was her immediate source was Jesus. So that's childlike. Believe before we understand. Unfortunately, I, when I grew up, it's always when I've... Um, in my lifetime, you end up with a lot of baggage. But as a child, if we can nurture them, we nurture our children to have that relationship early. And that, I think it's an instinct why the second testimony comes into play because there was this other little child that hasn't got this, um, never had this opportunity to be, um, uh, to have this influence over her. But naturally, she has it. And this little Riley, um, when we got to know the family, we gave the father um, some children's Bibles. And then we even went to Kurong. And I think we indescribable Bible. And there was this couple other little ones. But the one she loves most is the story, Child's Bible. And she carries that Bible everywhere she goes. Anyway, so um, she, she carries this Bible everywhere to the point where now the father's reading of the stories. The father reads the stories. Now the father's getting converted. He's virtually there because of her. So it's, not, it's no longer, it is childlike because he lives in the children. We have to have that revelation when we have to nurture that. And it's so beautiful to see that um, two different families the same outcome, Jesus. So Jesus lives in children. When Riley had uh, book week, her book week was she wanted to be like an angel. She dressed up like an angel. She dressed up like an angel, so she's more Christ-like. So she can be more like Christ. So that was her revelation of, of being an angel, um, an angel being like Christ. So, our, again, children, and I, I, I prayed a lot about it. So how can we be childlike? And the biggest thing you always come to me is rest in the Lord. Yeah. Children rest in the Lord. 
They just rest. They don't carry any, there's, there's always unforgiveness. There's always, children don't, there's not a, a grabbing the young, I'm talking about young children as they grow up, so there's no corruption in their, in their soul. And as they grow up, and it's beautiful, and they can convert very easily back to where Christ made them to be like. Um, just one more thing, with my other daughter, when she was little, her biggest thing was in the morning she'll wake up and explain to her mother, Sophia will explain to her mother, I've been to heaven, a city, she called it not heaven, city. I've been to the city and I saw this and I saw that. So, all right, fair enough. Her grandfather's passed away. But she used to describe a grandfather in the city. I thought, okay. Then one day we were at um, Chatswood. She goes to her mum. She goes to her mother, listen, mum, um, you know, I like coming to Chatswood, to Chatswood Chase. She's never been there before. Because her father loves going to Chatswood Chase. And then she says, you know what, mum, for lunch today I want a hot dog. She didn't know what a hot dog is. She was only three, three and a half. She never had a hot dog in her life. She says, oh, I want a hot dog. Because the grandfather loved hot dogs when he, when he went, went to the football. That's where he said so he liked his hot dogs. I thought, wow, this is just... And it started from Sophia, went to Teresa, and now with Riley, it's just the same pattern. God's in their heart. And what I'm trying to get to is that we become childlike as we, let, we rest in him and let things go. Allow him to work through us. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Rocco. Thank you. That was beautiful. Oh, man, I just want to sit with that for a second, hey? Yeah, how oh, great. Just like music this morning, we don't have to rush through Testimony Sunday. Just let that sit for a second. Wow. Thank you, Lord. We just receive your anointing to be like children coming to you. Father, we thank you that, that we can receive the anointing to grow in our sonship in you, to know our identity in Christ. And to be able to rest in your presence. All right, from the little ones, we're going to move to um, the older ones. Can I invite Shalane to come up? thing I've been thinking this morning is ask. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. And we had a, a great afternoon tea yesterday. Um, but And then Faye shared and we talked about it a bit and I saw something about, well, I'll tell it all. Um, I just saw I really wanted to get closer to God, and so what I was doing 
were seeing, how, how do I do this? I have to worship more. I have to read the Bible more. I have to do this. And, of course, it doesn't work because I'm just trying to earn his love. And so after the afternoon tea yesterday, and, and one thing Faye said, sorry, I'm talking about you. Um, one thing Faye said, just tell him, tell him. And I haven't had that time to say more than, hmm, I'm just trying too hard, aren't I? That's about my prayer. And, um, but I'm gradually, actually this morning, letting it out. And so thank you for everybody who is just here and, and just for being, I just love being part of the family. We love you, Shirley. All right, Miss Shalene. Yeah. yeah. Now, Shalene um, is the most. Is the is nervous? Nah, Shalene never gets nervous. <laughs> but she's the most beautiful, beautiful human being. She's the most encouraging person, and her testimony, if you ever get a chance to hear it is it will just rock your world, you know, and just the way that she describes what God has done in her life, like, it's impacted me so much, and her faith, if you're ever feeling just a little bit like, oh, you know, not very full of faith, just get around Shalane, man. She will just tell you how it is, that God is on the throne, and there's nothing that you can do um, to take yourself out of God's control, so... There you go. <laughs> Thank you, beautiful Thank you, Shalane. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Good morning. I'm really nervous. Uh, public speaking is just not my thing. Um, so I'm going to tell you a testimony about my grandfather. Actually, he's my grandfather's brother. But when my grandfather passed away, his brother stepped in and played that role. So we were really, really close. Um, so I come from a very, very staunch Hindu family who still practice, practices Hinduism. And my grandfather's brother, his name is George. Uh, he was one of them. But he married a Christian woman. And they never expected uh, the partner to convert. So they got married, whichever way they did. She remained Christian, uh, steadfast in her faith, and he remained a very staunch Hindu. And they had an absolutely beautiful marriage. Um, and then she passed away probably a year ago. And they had been together for 40 something years. And so he was a very active person, um, helped her a lot when she was ill, took care of her. It was, it was just such a beautiful relationship. And then when she passed away, he probably felt like he didn't have a reason to live anymore. And he became ill. He didn't tell anyone about it. Um, his liver started to fail, uh, which he just ignored because he just didn't want to do life without her anymore. And so, um, as I said, he was extremely active, always walking around, always doing stuff, always helping everyone. He was probably in his 70s, so like probably 77 or so. And then his kids called me and they said, you know, grandfather is very ill, um, would you like to speak to him? So I did. And when I spoke to him, we video called and um, it was really hard to see a person that barely even sat be bedridden. Um, so that, that took me aback. And then we kept in contact via video call. So I, I called him, we spoke, and he's a very funny person, very cynical, and even in that sick state, he was making jokes. So I thought, okay, there's probably still hope, uh, but not really with liver failure. And he was in the last stages of it where his skin color had changed. So he was completely yellow. 
uh, naturally his complexion is probably probably like mine, um, but he was completely yellow. So <clears throat> I called him another time, and we were talking, and by this time, his responses were not like before. He was saying less, uh, he couldn't understand much, he was just deteriorating further and further. And then I saw that they put a, a picture of one of their gods above his bed. And I thought to myself, he's about to die and he hasn't met Christ yet. And this really, really worried me. So the next day, uh, my aunt spoke to me and she said, look, he's not talking anymore. He's not responding. He's not moving. He's just in the bed, barely even able to eat, not even opening his eyes. And I thought to myself, what on earth is going to happen now? Where is he going to go? He's not even in a state for someone to come and minister to him and say, look, do, this is who Christ is. Do you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Nothing, because he's just at the, at the complete end. So I spoke to our connect group about it, and we said, okay, we're going to pray. And they encouraged me, and they said, you know, God can do things in, when a person is in any state. And honestly, I've never experienced something like that, so I did have doubts. I thought, how on earth is, gonna ha is this going to happen when a person can't confess it at all? So <clears throat> I just trusted in God, and I said, you know what? By me thinking like this, it's minimizing your power. Mm -hmm. And... I, I, I don't want to be caught in a situation like that where I just make God smaller than he is. So other people are praying and believing. I don't have the right not to do that. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to pray and I'm going to believe. However God does it, that's his way. He's going to do it. I'm just going to trust that he will. And so on the day that was his last, uh, the family got together around him. There are a handful of Christians in our family. So his wife was a Christian, she passed away. One of his daughters is a Christian. Um, the other three are not. So she was there with my mom, and uh, my mom is a Christian, and the rest of the family who are Hindus. And so everybody knew that, okay, this is it, he's gonna go. Uh, and they just spent time with him, and they were singing songs. And I didn't tell my family that I was praying for him, I didn't say that I was concerned about his salvation either. Most of them don't even know what salvation is. Um, and they stood around him and they were praying. And then my aunt said, when they were singing one of the hymns, I think it was in the sweet by and by, I'm not too sure if you guys are familiar with that. Uh, when they were singing that, they were, they were doing their Hindu chants before that. And then they left the Christian, I think it was just two Christian hymns to the end. When they were singing that song, he opened his eyes. And she said that when he opened his eyes, they were not yellow anymore. They moved on to the second song, and probably towards the end of the second song, his skin color started to change. So his eyes were not yellow anymore, his skin wasn't yellow anymore either. As his skin started to change, he opened his eyes again for the last time, closed it, and that was it. He was no more. Now, if someone told me that, and they were not my family, there's no way that I would believe that. My background is nursing. I know that if you have, if you're in the last stages of liver failure, there's no way that you're coming back from it. There's no way that your skin is gonna miraculously clear up and you're gonna be healed just before you die. It's impossible but this is what happened to him. And so I think that that was God's way of saying, you have been renewed, I have now restored you, you are, have now come home to me. Yeah. So thank you guys. Thank you, Shilling. What did I tell you, man? <laughs> that was incredible. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Wow. Uh, sorry, and just one more thing that I wanted to share. Um, both Thiessen and I had been here on visa, on Thiessen's work visa, and so we're currently pregnant. I uh, started a job six months ago, which means that I don't have maternity benefits. And being on the work visa means that I'm not gonna be compensated by the government either if I, if I don't work. So we had applied for permanent residency, and 
every time we spoke to the lawyer, they kept telling us negative things, like it's, there's a backlog uh, because of COVID and this, that, and the other. So I thought, oh my gosh, okay, what am I gonna do? So if, if I don't go to work, uh, I could only be with the baby for three months. And that's quite unheard of. I mean, the baby would still be very, very small. But because of financial uh, circumstances, I would need to go back to work as soon as possible. So I thought about it and I said, you know, God, you are in control. <laughs> There's nothing that we can do to sway a government into granting us permanent residency. But this child will be born at the time that you want it to be born. And so you will provide. And a lot of our family members were very concerned, but I really, really wasn't at all. I was like, whatever happens, God, you're in control. Whether we get granted PR or not, everything is gonna be okay. And then two weeks ago, out of the blue, without any warning, we received an email stating that our permanent residency had gotten granted. <laughs> the process, yeah. The process takes uh, seven to 10 months, uh, but because of COVID, they said one of Thiessen's colleagues is waiting after 24 months and it still hasn't been granted. Uh, so we were like, oh, you know, that's probably gonna happen to us or whatever, but we'll never know. Let's just, let's just pray and see what happens. And within 11 months, I was got granted. So uh, we now not only have a permanent residency, but the baby will also have dual citizenship which was very important to us as well. Yeah, so we just praise God for his goodness wow. and his yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Aussie baby, yeah? yeah. Aussie baby. Yeah. yeah, come on, we need more Aussies. Yeah. Oh, also, congratulations to Art and Jade and the kids who got their citizenship yesterday. Come on. Jade, yours is on the way. <laughs> um, oh, that is so good. That is so, so good. Wow. Now, um, I was going to ask Paul to come up, but I just want to open the floor to anyone who would like to come and share something. Um, even if it wasn't planned, if the Holy Spirit's saying to you, you need to go share that, please feel free to come up. Come on, I love hearing from you, Bibi. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> um, this isn't really a testimony as such, but while we were doing the worship today, I don't know, I just started thinking um, about certain things in the Bible. And then Denise got up and read from the New Testament um, the story of Mary Magdalene. And while we were listening to worship, that's actually what I was thinking about. I was thinking about Mary Magdalene. Um, and particularly when we're seeing, Lord, you're so beautiful. You're so beautiful. Um, Mary is one of my favorite characters in the Bible. And she's not just a supporting character. She's not just one of these people that pops in and pops out and Jesus does a miracle and we don't hear what happens next. She actually appears about four times in the New Testament. We have the story of Mary coming to Jesus um, and a lot of people say that she was a prostitute. The, the Bible doesn't actually say that, but it says that people said she was a sinful woman. Um, I'm going to suggest the bar for being a sinful woman was probably not very high in those days. <laughs> um, so we don't know exactly why she was called sinful. It could have been that. It could have been something else. But we have that story of Mary coming to Jesus and literally washing his feet with her tears, drying his feet with her hair, and pouring this jar of expensive perfume on his feet. We have the story of Mary um, sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha is around preparing the food um, and taking care of all the cleaning and stuff. And my God, this woman loved Jesus. She loved him. You can tell that from the stories. Um, so the other thing I was thinking is that when we look at this really, this extravagant gesture that, of love 
that, that Mary gave to Jesus. Um, it's said that this jar of perfume that she had, the Bible tells us it was worth about a year's wages. So imagine having a jar of perfume <laughs> that's worth, let's say, $100,000. Extremely expensive. And we know that Mary was unmarried. She was living with her sister and her brother, which probably means her parents were long gone. And in those days, women belonged to either their father or they belonged to their husband. She had no father, she had no husband. She did have a brother. At least she had that. He kind of took care of her a bit, I guess. Um, but she had nothing and no one else, but she had this jar of perfume. And a lot of scholars say, well, how did this woman have this extraordinarily expensive object? Um, and the answer a lot of them give is that this was her dowry. This was what she intended to bring to her husband when she got married. Um, so can you imagine what it cost her, this gesture of love? She took all her hopes and her dreams for the future. She took everything that she was trusting in, all of her dreams of what she thought her life could possibly be like, and she poured it out on Jesus' feet. Just gave it away. Gave away all her hopes and dreams. But do you know what Mary got in return? Do you know what else Mary saw in her lifetime? Mary saw her brother Lazarus be raised from the dead. Not only that, but Mary saw the risen Jesus Christ. She was the first person there. When he walked out of his tomb, Mary was waiting. She saw the glory of our risen Lord. And I was just thinking, you know, maybe there's some things that we are holding on to. Our hopes and our dreams, things that we trust in for the future, dreams that we have for what our life may be like. And maybe sometimes we have to give those up and pour those out on Jesus' feet. And it hurts. It costs you. But you know what? What he's going to give you in return can be so much better than that. Maybe in return for that, you get to see the risen Lord. Um, that's, <laughs> I was just sit, sitting there thinking about those things and thinking, well, you know, it's not really, not really a, a testimony, you know, maybe this is just for me to think on. But then, you know, Denise read out her story and I'm like, no, I have to get up and tell you guys this. Um, yeah. Thank you. That was incredible. <laughs> Thank you, Vivi. Mm. Okay, Jim is, Jim is asking me to pray. Um, all right. Lord Jesus, thank you for your presence here today. Lord, you know all of us have dreams in our hearts. You know all of us have things that we're holding on to. All of us have hopes. All of us have things that we hold precious. And Lord, sometimes you ask us to give up those things. Not because you want to take things away from us, Lord, but because you want to give us so much more and so much better. Lord, help us to just hold out our hands and leave them open, Lord, and let go. Let go of what we're holding on to, Lord. Help us open our hands. And Lord, thank you. Thank you for the glory of your presence and your love and everything you are going to pour out on us in return. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for the hope we have in you. We thank you for the new future, the new life you are going to give us in return. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right, we are going to invite A. Mary to come up now. <laughs>
Look at that. Couldn't have organized that better. Hey guys, I wasn't uh, planning on, uh, I didn't even know today was Testimony Sunday, so I, I wanted to be here and see everyone and be a part of our get together. <laughs> I haven't been for about three weeks, but having um, heard BB, very shattered, it, it's just sparked um, a, in my heart, I know that I can't do anything apart from him. Can't even take my next breath apart from him. And we're hearing um, Libby say about Mary, but she was totally reliant on him for everything. When Lazarus was... uh, dead, her sister Martha that knew the Bible and she was eloquent in, in you know, she went up to Jesus and said, um, you know, he's, he's dead. And Jesus goes, why don't you believe me? I'm, um, I'm the resurrection and I'm the life. And Martha goes, yeah, 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 we know you're the resurrection, you're the life, blah, 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 blah. I know he'll rise one day. And, and so she, she mentally knew how to answer Christianese and Christian answers and Christian ABCs, you know, on point. Mary goes and she says the same thing, but she, in her heart, she's going, Lord, help me, help me believe that you, you can do it. My brother's dead. And she started crying and Jesus let out a groan that was heard around him for him to react. Same answers, different heart. And, we're, and, and, and I go, Lord, help me have this heart. Help me have a heart that moves you. Not for me to say the right thing at the right time and, and have all the answers, you know, to answer people around me. And Jesus says, in my heart, if, if, if you do that, if you let me, I'll defend you. And I said, okay. And, it, and we, we brought up when Mary went and she poured the extravagance of the oil and, and, and the perfume, sorry, and the oil. And she was extravagantly um, just bathing uh, Jesus in this. In a, it, it was like a worship um, stance. And everyone around was going, what is she doing, man? You know how many people we could have fed? We knew, you know how many poor we could have, you know, touched? You know how many communities we could have? And it was, it was they were banging on about, you know, her extravagance of love. And Jesus turns around. She didn't say a word. And he stopped them. And he defended her. So... He answered my prayer, and, and in that sense, and I thought, Lord, we've got nothing. <laughs> You're our defender. We don't have to say a thing. All we do, all we can do, is in our hearts just be open to Your love and to Your leading, and 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 to Your into Your in, instruction and guiding through Your love. So um, that testimony was for me because, yeah, I I, I needed to hear it. BB, and, and thank you for sharing that. And it spoke volumes, and I'm sure you encouraged everyone else around you. So, thank you, guys. Wow, that's epic. You never know, hey, whose blessing is on the other side of your obedience. Yeah. Is anyone else who would like to come up and share something? Come on, Leisha. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. (laughs) So this is an unplanned one. So this is just the Holy Spirit giving me a nudge while I was sitting down. Um, With our group, we've got a Bible study group. Um, 
that happens, and it's really lovely. We cover a whole lot of different topics. And one of the things we've been looking at is spiritual discernment. So we, every day we go and as a group we comment um, about different topics. So spiritual discernment was the topic. And the question that was posed um, last week was, what aspect of your parenting can you pray and ask God to give you more discernment in today? So this was all about spiritual discernment. <clears throat> And I said to the Lord, but Lord, I don't have children. I said, how can I apply this, Lord? What aspect of your parenting can you pray and ask God for more spiritual discernment? And so I felt the Lord um, say this to me. He brought me to Luke 15, which is about the story of the prodigal son. And of course, it's about the father. Um, the son has gone away and the father never ran after the son. But when he saw the son in the distance, he ran to the son and had open arms. And I thought, wow. I thought, I can actually apply this to my friends. Um, so this is what I wrote in our group, in our group chat. I said, even though I don't have children, I can relate to the story in Luke 15 of the prodigal son to my friends. I find this a real challenge Forgiving them is one thing, so I don't find forgiveness a challenge in itself. But what I find is to treat them with open arms again quite another, because I tend to shrink away if someone has hurt me and become more guarded, withholding more of myself in case they hurt me again. So the love of God is extravagant and he lavishes it upon us. And I said, I pray that I would be able to walk in his kind of love and be a carrier of the glory of his love and presence. Amen. So that was the prayer I prayed. The next day, <laughs> the very next day, a friend of mine reached out to me that I hadn't spoken to for over three years. And we had been incredibly close. And the breakup of that friendship had been very painful for me. And he reached out and he just said, look, I'm sorry um, for a whole range of reasons. But he just said, you know, I never meant the friendship to end that way. So for me, it was like there he was in the distance. He'd drawn closer to me. And I said to him, you know what? The door was never closed. And so our friendship has um, emerged again. And it's just absolutely incredible. It's like we never, that time was never lost so praise God, he answered my prayer. That is awesome. That is so awesome. All right, sorry, Paul. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Tony, come on. No, no, you're not pushing in at all. <laughs> Hi, guys. I just want to share something that happened a long time ago. Um, uh, once had a, uh, a, a small business, and uh, and I uh, so I would employ a number of people. They come and go. Um, but every time that they came, whoever came wasn't safe because they would hear about Jesus. Um, so this particular person came in, and I'd employed him, and his name was Ismail. Right? Ismail. His name was Ismail. Um, so, um, during our time there, or well, his time there, I kept calling him Ishmael. And so one day he says to me, why do you call me Ishmael? Said, My name is Ismail. And I said, oh, sorry, you just remind me of, uh, Ishmael is in, actually in the Bible, like, you know. And so I started to share with him who Ishmael was, like, and, you know, like, he, he was, uh, Isaac's um, brother from another mother. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, the conversation just um, kept going and I, I'll, I'd be sharing with him all the time. Um, one day, um, I, I, I wanted him to understand. Um, is one day at the previous church, I was standing there, we had the uh, creationist um, uh, magazine people came in and they were selling books and that so I asked 
Are you got any books on um, for Muslims like? I'll be able to share with Muslims. And they had this book that was called On the Road to Emmaus, where Jesus appears to the two strangers on the road and he explains all the things that must happen um, for the Christ to be uh, crucified, resurrected. And, and it was a really good book. It really enlightened me. Um, so after I read it, I, I said, look, I've got this book. Uh, I just want to share it with you. You, you want, want to read it? He goes, yeah, no worries, I'll read it. So anyway, I gave him the book. Um, some time had gone past. And so I said to him, Ishmael, what happened in the book? He goes, oh, I've given it to my sister. She's reading it. Uh, okay, no worries. Another week or two had gone by. Ishmael, what happened in the book? Oh, my auntie has got it. Okay. <laughs> time goes by again. Ishmael, what happened in the book? Oh, my uncle has got it. And I said, you know what? You keep the book, but you make sure that you circulate that book amongst your family. <laughs> so um, Ishmael, uh, Ishmael, <laughs> kept calling him Ishmael, uh, he leaves me for greener, greener pastures. Uh, he was only with me for about six months or so. Nice kid. And I thought, well, you know, God, I, I sort of I missed that. Eh? <laughs> I, I sort of missed that. Um, but two years had gone past. I never heard from Ishmael. I haven't spoken to him. I haven't seen him. And uh, Kamal and I were at uh, a motorbike place in Parramatta, Bike Biz. And, uh, and who was there? Ishmael. I was so happy to see him, you know. So I said, oh, Ishmael. Hey, how are you going? He said, oh, Tony, you hey, good, good. He says, but I'm not. Ishmael anymore. I said, what are you talking about? He says, my name is Isaac. <laughs> and I nearly dropped that. I thought, how good is God? And you think you've missed it, but because of what you have done, done you've, you, you've, you've sown a seed, you open somebody's heart, God has come through. And I just share that because I want to give glory to God because he hears our prayers. Uh, he knows your heart, and he's true to his word. Amen. Simple as that. <laughs> so, Father God, we thank you that um, you are the one and only that we can turn to, that you will never leave us, you will never let us down, and you'll never forsake us, Lord. As your children, we just want to thank you and, and praise you and honour you, Lord. And thank you, Lord, that you stir up our hearts, our mind and our soul and that we, and we feel your presence, Lord. And when we step out, when we step out and declare your name, you give us such a joy that is indescribable. So may all our praise, glory and honour always go to you in your precious name. Amen. 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 Wow. Where did the time go? Jimmy, do we have time for one more? Yep. My name's Jimmy. <laughs> All right, we'll take all the testimonies we can get. Is there anyone else who would like to come up? Yeah, come on, Rocco. One more. Here we go. Because of um, this is a salvation one. Um, uh, um, What we're hearing today is that he lives in us. He guides us. He teaches us. The Holy Spirit will never leave us. Um, in my prayer walk and praying and praying and praying, there's a whole lot of families. <clears throat> us as a group, continuous prayer um, and salvations where it's needed and allow Jesus to do his work. Um, leave it up to him in the sense of his full authority and dominion. So anyway, praying for this family and continual prayer and 
um, I even there was a, an illness in the family and uh, I um, gave a devotional to the mother and allow that to be a seed. Um, not that they were believers, but allow that to be a seed. And it was a Jesus calling. And um, it, I, I believe that that would have, I'm not sure if they were starting to read it immediately or not, but I believe that that would have been a, 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 a road to, to having a visitation or a feeling or when I say feeling a, um, a presence of him um, would have been about I don't know about four weeks ago um, I get a phone call that she wants to see me because she's seen darkness and darkness all around her she's not well she's in the hospital and she's just seen this darkness and it's an overwhelming feeling in her um so yeah i'll call just step back ever since covid i've always said proclaim the gospel that's where the power is keep proclaiming and i would never have done this before to turn up and and give some um um uh, scripture walking through to jesus so i did i did turn up i went to the hospital we sat had a long uh, conversation um, it converted back to Jesus and from the beginning to the end how we how we lost our blessing and, and salvation and our, our um, how um, uh, the we were apart from God we were torn apart and that continued on till the second Adam I explained the two Adams and Jesus being the second gave us that door to open up so we can have we can be the light and that light will disperse any darkness that you have in your room so we got to that conversation questions or answer uh, questions were put to me answered um and the next step was can we pray together so we prayed led it to the lord um so and that was um, leading it to the lord was like a peace she said I, I feel this peace so I gave her the scripture that I was saying before in John 14 uh, 27 um, I gave her what the kingdom of God is is another scripture but then Psalm 91 which gives her protection Jesus gives her the protection but I want her words to come out from her heart and in this salvation was just a beautiful moment to see the presence of the Lord come upon us and she felt that and that was her journey now, leaving her um, another devotional and a Bible, um, New Living Translation, just so she has that, um, it's just a flowing for her to, in her, the translation's much easier in the English. Um, so, yeah, and her journey now is that she's getting stronger in the hospital. Um, we're, we're praying for uh, full healing um, yeah, it'll be a miracle. And then the miracle's coming. Amen. So I thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. Amen. Wow, that's so good. Amen. All right, one last one. And how good is it that testimonies are a normal part of being Christian? Man, all right, I'm going to ask Paul to come up, please. <laughs> we love to hear from Paul. You know, it's funny, I remember once Paul was preaching and he says, oh, I'm not really a people person. But he has the most time for people. And any time you're going to speak to him, he's so kind and so gentle. And always has something encouraging to say. So thank you, Paul. Thanks, Faye. Thank you. Um, before I get started, I want to um, just share this scripture. Because I think it's um, the common theme of what we're hearing today. It comes from uh, Luke. It says, uh, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. So I guess through this testimony um, and through all the ones we've heard, if there's anything that some of us are going through that we, that, that we feel that it's an impossible situation, we serve a God where he calls the impossible possible. And it's just the nature of God and who he is. And uh, so this testimony happened five years ago, and it's come up twice in the last month. I shared it with Ben and Hannah at Maria's party and come up on Tuesday at home group. So it's not something that I had kind of been planning to share, but I guess God's kind of um, 
wanting me to share it. So as some of you know, I own, uh, I own a couple of cafes. Uh, before we owned um, the cafes, we had a very small operation, like a, a very small cafe that we had. And we had NRMA um, about five minutes up the road where we were, and the CFO used to come down and have coffee. He used to walk five minutes. He used to love our coffee and just chat with me and my business partner. And, and he said, oh, you know, NRMA are moving to Olympic Park. You guys should tender for the cafe because there's going to be a cafe. There's five levels of offices, 500 people moving in. And he goes, you guys should tender for the cafe. And we said, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd, we had no idea what a tender was. <laughs> we just pretended we knew. So we said, yeah, yeah, no worries. So we Googled what a tender was. <laughs> and we... Uh, we submitted the tender, and uh, and they ba were basically were unsuccessful because we were our, our operation was so small where we currently were. They were worried that we were a liability going into such a big space with um, 500 people. So anyway, we um, we used to walk past the cafe that we currently have. It was very close to the cafe that we were operating, and we used to always walk past and say, "Man, they'd make a great cafe there," but it was leased out. Anyway, long story short, we found out that the lease had fallen through with the guy that had secured the, uh, the lease. So we jumped on that spot and they said yes to us. So we started construction and basically put all our money into to that spot. So a year had gone by. We were six weeks from opening and a year had gone by since they said no to us at NRMA. And the guy that we were dealing with found me and my business partner six weeks after we were about to open North Stratfield. And he said... Um, We've actually had an issue with the guy that we were going to go with. Are you guys still interested? And we said, look, man, we'd love to, but we have no money because we're just about to open. We've put everything. We... And he goes, look, don't worry about the money. Just come and check out the, um, the spot. So he took us to Olympic Park. He took us to, like, the rooftop. And he was, like, you know, just luring us and, and, and saying all this stuff. And then he took us downstairs and he showed us the spot. It's a beautiful spot. And basically we said, okay, what's the deal? And he said, we're going to put in $450,000. He goes, to the cafe, so they were going to contribute that. He goes, all you have to do is come up with basically the equipment. So I said to my business partner, man, we have to do this. It's just the opportunity is too good to, to refuse. So we did it. So we opened two cafes within six months of each other with absolutely no money with the second one. So we basically, Age and I, we, got a, we extended our mortgage. And basically the first two years was like a nightmare. I would go into the bathroom during trade and I'd look at myself in the mirror and, and say, what have you done? Because we had no money. We were literally, I don't know how we were trading. We had people calling us. Uh, the milk supplier called my business partner one time at three o'clock in the morning and said, we can't deliver your milk uh, because you haven't paid your bill. Obviously without milk, you can't make coffee. It's very difficult. <laughs> Um, or you could just have black coffees, but um, anyway, so we, the, the financial pressure was just enormous, like, I, and I had never felt financial pressure before. Um, throughout my life, we had never had credit cards. We had only, what we, what we could afford is what we, what we could, what we had. We never went, we, we never lived beyond our means, so financial pressure was not something that I, I was familiar with. And, um, we lived like this for about two years. We worked seven days a week, me and my business partner. And age was at home with Ava. Ava was pretty much just born. And I guess it's a testimony to her to have a supportive wife or a supportive spouse because she, um, she was a rock through that time. And anyway, so we were living like this for, for two to three years. And um, there was a guy that had a burger truck. And he's got 30,000 followers across Instagram. He has people lining up for hours just wanting to have his burgers. And he had his burger truck burnt down in transit. So basically what he was doing, he was going to cafes and leasing out their kitchens uh, in the evenings. And I saw this guy, I was mopping the floor one time at Olympic Park on a Friday afternoon, and I saw him walk past and I knew who he was. And I'm like, man, I'm going to ask him if he wants to lease out North Stratfield. And then I'll go, oh, I'll just wait for him to come back. He didn't come back. Um, then I hopped on my scooter that afternoon and I was bringing some stuff from North Stratford, from Olympic Park because we didn't want to waste anything because we wanted to sell everything. So we had Olympic Park only trains Monday to Friday with North Stratford seven days. So I brought some stuff from Olympic Park to North Stratford. And as I was riding my scooter, I saw him. 
So I pulled my scooter over and I chased after him. He was walking up a hill with his AirPods on and I was trying to get his attention, say, hey, mate, excuse me, excuse me. And his guy just kept walking. I said, man, I want to scare this guy because he's a big guy. He's just going to turn around and whack me. So eventually I finally got his attention and said, hey, bro, I've got this this cafe just down the road. I said, I think um, I know what happened to your truck. I I go, would you consider maybe coming down, just having a look at the spot? I reckon reckon you'd do well there. And it's kind of like, oh, man, we're about to get the truck back up on the road. We're probably not that interested. He goes, but look, we'll exchange details. And, uh, and go from there. I said, okay, cool. So he DM'd, he sent me a message on Instagram about a week later. He goes, man, can we have a meeting? I said, yeah, sure. So he came basically to North Stratfield and had a look at the spot. And uh, he goes, look, man, we actually really like the spot. He goes, even though we're going to get the food truck up and running, he goes, we actually want to lease the cafe out. He goes, but we're only going to do it probably for about three months. I said, okay, no worries. So he was there for three months and three months turned into six months. And then eventually he got his truck back up and his truck wasn't as busy as he was trading out an all strap field. So then a year went by and he was doing both. Then eventually he got rid of his truck and he's just at all strap field now. He's been there going on four years. And just to give you an indication, financially, he's brought into our business through paying rent and sales of different things, half over half a million dollars that has basically completely got us out of the, the, the horrific uh, financial debt that we were in, but then moved us in, obviously, to, to the positive. And I don't say that to boast, um, like I'm a smart businessman or anything like that, <laughs> because I'm not. I just have, uh, I guess, I mean, in operationally, yeah, I guess, but I'm saying in this particular blessing, it was simply, I think, it was the favor of God that, that got us out of this. And, um, and I, think, I think one of the takeaways is that I want to encourage us is just to go for it. Yeah. Like I chased after that guy and don't be scared to ask people the question. Just go for it. Like if there's, if there's a business opportunity or there's something, obviously if you feel in God, just go for it. Just be bold and go for things because the favor of God is upon us. Yeah. And um, yeah, so... Praise be to God. <laughs> well, Ken. Thank you, Paul. Just a little plug, because the burgers there are amazing. If you like a burger, please go to visit the uh, conservatorium, um, which is Paul's Cafe at North uh, Strathfield. You will be in for a treat. Yes. Um, all right. I think that's... Um, what we have time for today. I know, aww. <laughs> but the good thing is that we will keep having Testimony Sunday. So please, you know, keep those testimonies in your pocket. Keep collecting them. Um, and yeah, don't wait for a Testimony Sunday to share them. Share them with whoever you meet because you never know who needs to hear what, what story God has given to you. So yeah, like Paul said, be bold, be bold. And be blessed. Yeah, we're going to close the meeting now. Maybe I'll just quickly pray for everyone. Um, So, Father, thank you that we can just get up and talk about your goodness and talk about how wonderful and amazing you are, Lord. Um, And most of all, Lord, thank you that in every testimony, um, it draws us to your heart, Lord. It shows us who you really are. It reveals your character and your nature to us, that you're good and that you're faithful um, and that you care about the minutia of our lives, Lord. So, Father, we thank you um, that as we leave today, we can go with your peace and we know that we have your favor. In Jesus' name, amen.